My name is Mary Calvert, and I am in Friday Harbor, Washington, interviewing Gordon Steele on June the 16th, 2014, for the Atomic Heritage Foundation Manhattan Voices Project. Gordon? My name is Gordon, and uh, you would like me to spell my name? Please spell your name for me. It's uh, Gordon, G-O-R-D-O-N, Steele, S-T-E-E-L-E. -E. Thank you. The questions I'm going to ask you are about your time at Oak Ridge, Tennessee, and I'd like to start with how did you first become involved on the Manhattan Project? Well, it so happens when I was a, a, a senior student in chemistry at UC Berkeley, I ran into a friend who uh, told me about this uh, a project that he had just hired on to, and so he said they were hiring, and uh, it was uh, about uh, uh, a nuclear uh, material that uh, uh, would be a new energy and he thought they were probably working on a bomb uh, that that was telling me he was told not to tell that but you know students so oh, I went to the I went to the to the radiation lab and uh, applied for a job and, and I was interviewed there by a uh, nice med gentleman uh, his name was McKay, and uh, they hired me. Wonderful. At Berkeley, in the radiation lab, and in your chemistry background, who did you work with? Um, what Nobel laureate did you work with? Uh, Ernst Lawrence? Uh, it was, uh, oh, I, got the, I got the name here. I can't put my tongue on it. Uh, Lawrence, Dr. Lawrence. Uh, I reported to work in one of his labs in the physics building. Uh, he, he's the one that invented the cyclotron, you know. Yes. What was special about your background that made you a good candidate for working on the Manhattan Project? Well, I was a chemistry student, and uh, I, uh, I was available, <laughs> and I needed a job, part-time job. Yes. What was your initial job on the project? Well, they put me to work uh, on uh, tubaloy tetrachloride. Tubaloy, was the, I learned, was the secret name for uranium and uh, what I did was work with a group of uh, lady students yeah, lady students who were operating uh, some st some vacuum uh, distillation it isn't a sublimation really of uranium tetrafluoride um, uh, I didn't know exactly what the what the how they why they needed the fluoride, but uh, I I was sort of ahead of that project. I was hired by a person um, who I got to know quite well it was uh, Bob Schmidt. Uh, he apparently uh, had been with the project for some time. I think he was a physicist. You arrived at Oak Ridge with a friend. Yes, I did. I had, a, had quite a time. I, the, uh, I was hired early in the, or I about in the in the early spring, I think, or late winter, to to on the project. And um, when I graduated in uh, June. Uh, they wanted me to uh, move to Oak Ridge, so I they, uh, by they wanted me to fly, and I said no, I want to drive. So after a little argument, uh, they said okay, but I have to take John Moffat with me. Uh, so he and I came across 
the nation. Together, we became great friends. Your badge number at Oak Ridge was? Uh, I think I think it was 120, uh, it was 129. Yes. How much were you told about the project when you were at Oak Ridge? Well, before the, before I got to Oak Ridge, I knew that uh, what the uranium was for. Um, uh, I, uh, uh, Bob uh, Bob Schmidt uh, and I became great friends, uh, and so I knew by that time that uh, we were working on a bomb, and that it involved a tubuloy tetrafluoride tubuloy. Did you have any role in the intelligence or the security? part of Oak Ridge? No, uh, but I had been warned not to uh, uh, not to uh, reveal information or discuss it uh, off of the premises. Did you come into contact with any people who were later known to be spies? No, I, I did not. Uh, however, I did have uh, uh, the experience of having someone who had worked in, uh, for the project fired for talking in the hallway. What were some of the serious challenges that you and your colleagues faced at Oak Ridge? Challenges? Uh, I, uh, I, did, I, I don't think I had anything that I would call talent, challenges. I, I just used my knowledge as a chemist and uh, uh, did as well as I could with what they gave me, uh, the work they gave me. What kind of a work schedule did you have? Well, it was, uh, of course, an eight-hour-a-day job, but um, there were certainly uh, times in which uh, you had to put in a good deal more time than that. What did you do in your spare time for entertainment? <laughs> well, they would... Uh, they would have uh, dances on Saturday night um, since there were so many women there. <laughs> it was a bit of a flurry. Uh, uh, but uh, uh, of course you're dating and uh, I had some interesting uh, experiences with that. but. Uh, we, uh, uh, a group of us, finally got together and rented a house over at the lake, and uh, we'd go there weekends. We'd go off uh, island to buy booze, or uh, to go to dinner. Uh, you could just come and go. It wasn't any problem. Of course, the the town had a gate. Uh, you had to go through and you, had, you needed to have your badge and, the, and an ID. Describe the housing that you lived in. When I first got there, it was a dormitory. <laughs> uh, uh, nothing in it but beds and so on. Uh, the living, uh, such as eating, was was... Uh, supplied by a restaurant uh, run by local people. <laughs> Got a little tired of greens. <laughs> Were you married at the time that you arrived at Oak Ridge? No, I, I was single and uh, I ultimately had a, 
not some lady that I wanted to marry, but decided not to marry until the war, war was over. <clears throat> Were you confident that the Manhattan Project would succeed? Well, I certainly was confident that we could turn out the uranium. Um, uh, um, the uranium-235, but uh, I had no very little. I had some knowledge, but I had very little knowledge of what was going on at the other end of the line at uh, in New Mexico. At uh, hmm, hmm. Los Alamos. Yeah, you got it. Did you worry about Hitler coming up with a bomb before the United States? Well, I... I I don't think I, uh, I, I'm not just sure that I, how much I knew about the Germans' progress, but if I had thought of it, I'm sh I've been bothered with it, I, I'm certain that uh, it would be a too difficult thing for them to pull off, considering the magnitude of the effort that the United States was making. I knew that that they had uh, tried to get uh, heavy water from uh, from Norway and that they had been uh, foiled by the Norwegians who stunk it before they could get it to Germany. But uh, that's, that's not much so I, I didn't worry very much about it. I, I was too busy with uh, my own stuff. Did your attitude <clears throat> with respect to your confidence in the success of the project change over the course of the time you worked on the project? Not at all. I, uh, I and my fellow men, just my friends, were run fast out. Hard. What role did patriotism and wanting to win the war play in motivating you and your colleagues? Well, of course, we got a lot of of uh, feedback on the progress of the war, and uh, those of us who knew what we were doing uh, were very. Uh, very intent on getting the material to um, to to, oh, to uh, what what would, I can't think of the name of the place there again. Los Alamos. Los Alamos, gosh. Uh, but we uh, we had some information uh, coming back from the the. The, the guys who in the know went there to do things and some of the people from there came to a little grid. And so we got some uh, some picture of what was going on there and uh, I heard uh, about uh, some of the problems and some of the solutions. But uh, it was uh, full out to get it done. I knew that, that once they dropped the bomb, the war would be very shortly over by then. Were you aware of the planned invasion of the Japanese homeland? I strangely, strange to say, that was a conversation piece. It wasn't uh, classified or anything. And we, we used to, uh, talk about the, the, the destruction that, that uh, would uh, 
happened because of that, because, you know, the Japanese would fight to the very, very last person. And uh, so we knew the, the importance of the bomb, I think. Uh, and uh, we're very much encouraged when you, while you're talking about that part, we knew when, when the Trinity test was made and that it was successful. Yes. It was <laughs> you knew it had accomplished the goal. That yet. Because you got to realize there they just put a bunch of stuff together and, and, uh, and set off the uranium, but to deliver it was another problem. How did you feel about the decision to drop the bomb on Japan? That's an interesting problem. I mean, interesting. Like, my first, my my first feeling was, surely now is the end of the war. But when I they dropped the second bomb, the plutonium bomb, I. I was very upset about that. Later on, I got the story, uh, which was came through t just conversation, that after they dropped the first bomb, the the civilian representative in Japan and the military representative in Japan. <coughs> got together with the um, emperor and trying to decide whether they should give up and the the civilian wanted to to yield but uh, but the military one did not and it was up to the emperor to throw it one way or another and he went with the with uh, he went with with the army, and so their the, the refuse to get up caused them to use the new polonium uh, the polonium bomb, and and I understood that, and so I, I I accepted it better, but there was quite a wave of intelligentsia at Oak Ridge, uh, just the, the, the physicists and chemists and, uh, got together and at the, at the you know, auditorium at the school and discussed uh, the future of uh, the, the uranium bomb. How do you feel about your role in the Manhattan Project? Well, it was pretty small, but somebody had to do it. And I knew it was historic. Uh, and I was grateful to be part of it. Um, if it had not been that, then I and many of the people who were involved would have to go off to war. It's funny because they combed the, the armies for uh, people with a technical inf inf uh, background and brought them to Oak Ridge. They worked for the army. I mean, they were paid and maintained by the army, but they were working on the bomb. Can you talk about any contact you had with General Groves or any of the other famous figures? Uh, General Grove came, I worked in the R&D building uh, at Oak Ridge uh, and we had some pretty interesting work going on there. Uh, I, uh, and one day, uh, 
Groves came in, and uh, I think uh, Herb uh, uh, Young, uh, well, Young, Young, Herb Young joined them and took them for a, a look uh, through the R and D facility, and uh, of course I knew him as soon as I saw him. He didn't stop and say hello or anything, and he and he had. Uh, uh, some of the um, uh, leading physicists. Now, who they were, I didn't know, but uh, I, uh, they, they came down the hall sweeping by and they looked in at my stuff and they looked in at some of the others too. And uh, I think they were headed to Ed Wagner. Now, I hadn't told you this before. But Ed Wagner has, uh, had worked with me previously on the project uh, at Davis, the University of California, Davis. We had a group there, uh, and uh, Ed, we, Ed and I were both working on converting uranium oxide to uranium tetrafluoride, chloride, excuse me. And, uh, my my uh, process uh, w uh, was not working out well and wasn't uh, worth pursuing beyond keeping me employed with something. But Ed had developed a process for feeding the uranium powder into a glass tube that was rotating. And of course, the whole system is all sealed up. And then, the uh, surrounding the glass tube was, was a furnace, a, uh, just, just about uh, about eighteen inches long. Uh, and the 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 powder of the uh, of uranium would be dropped in there at the same time that they were feeding uran uh, carbon tetrachloride. Well, when these two things were together in the, in the heated area, it would make uranium tetrachloride out of it. And uh, I, did, I did some work with the same idea, but uh, mine wasn't rotating. Uh, and what happens uh, was that uh, when it created the fluoride, it had a tendency to stick to the glass. So, Ted, I mean, Ed came up with the idea with a tapper. So he built a tapper. It just went like that. And, it, and the, the, the powder wouldn't stick and it came out the end. Uh, I thought that was a kind of a foolish thing to be working on, because there's no way you could make a lot of uranium tetrachloride that way. Uh, uranium tetrachloride, of course, was the stuff that went into the calutron to, to separate. And, uh, uh, well, that's just a, a side thing. And now when we went to Oak Ridge, he was still working on this. Out in the back room, he had this tube, and I, I, he was trying to improve on that process. It never occurred to me that they could not make the ten uranium tetrafluoride, that precious stuff. Uh, you, could, you could not make it by the same process which they were uh, purifying the recycled uranium you know, because that went back to feed back into the to the coronation process was a liquid phase type. Let's clarify. When you were working with Ed Wagner on this project, it was at UC Davis. That's right. Yeah, we were there for months. They had a group there, and it was there. I think that that, that the person of which uh, got fired because he was talking in the hallway, he was there too. You worked at 
Berkeley yes. after you graduated uh -huh. with Bob Schmidt. Yes, but tell me about the story with Ernest Lawrence. Oh well, what what we were doing with uh, with Bob Schmidt's group uh, was they would buy uranium uh, fluoride as a chemical at that point because they had no way of making it, okay? So they put me in charge of that process where we were uh, converting, bought uranium fluoride into a vaporizable, controllable material. And so uh, th that was done by a vacuum sublimation of the material. Uh, process that went on to the big uh, to, to, to uh, Oak Ridge, but uh, they used that in the cyclotron converted to what was called the calutron, uh, and so they needed that material up on the hill. So and it cal the cyclotron operation was up on the hill by the football field, and so they needed some up there and. And uh, so I, I took it up, uh, and as I was, it's just a walking distance because the football field's up there and uh, not that far up, you know. So I was walking up, and this car came along, and the, the driver gave me a lift <laughs> with Lawrence, Dr. Lawrence, and we had a nice conversation, just student type, you know. That's that's the only time I saw him. He of course never went to Oak Ridge. He stayed back experimenting with the calutron. This group that I went to work with at at the physics building lab uh, were girls, and so I was uh, uh, more or less running the process in my spare time because I was still a student there. Uh, and uh, th that that they were pretty much convinced that that was the best kind of uranium tetrafluoride they could put in to to manage what they needed for the for the calutron, which was the cycle was the 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 separation process uh, developed from the cyclotron type. Uh, Gordon, is it? Fluoride or chloride? Tetrachloride or fluoride? It's, oh, did I say fluoride? You did. Uh, you mean, was, it's chloride. Yes, thank you. Now, fluoride comes into the story uh, uh, much later. That's okay. We've clarified what it is. Okay. Go ahead. All right. Um, and, and so I, I, I got a ride up there with him. I had to walk back. <laughs> yes. So you're talking about the girls in the lab oh, at Berkeley? Yeah. Uh, so so the, they they did all the work and I just overlooked it. So Bob and I were free to uh, to experiment with that process. Bob Schmidt. Yes, Bob Schmidt. On a larger scale, and so this material, uranium tetrachloride, is very hydroscopic. And when it reacts with the moisture in the air, it turns to an oxide and it lets off chlorine stuff and all that. And um, so we built a dry room there. And he, he also designed and had built a vacuum chamber in which we could uh, distill larger uh, batches. It was a a terrible thing, but we bu they uh, built a dry room and keep the room dry. They had a suit in there that you would put on <laughs> and <laughs> shove the end of the, the receiver in this distillation process, sublimation. And I say distillation, I mean sublimation. And uh, that's, of course, where it leaves solid and it condenses the solid. 
Anyway, uh, so we built, put this vacuum equipment next to the dry room. <laughs> I had a hose on me and I went in the dry room and I'd, and I'd take the uranium out of the vacuum system and uh, put it in the airtight containers. Uh, it was kind of an, uh, it was just a, a trial for to see if 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 that was going to be the way they did it really in Oak Ridge. I mean, yeah, in Oak Ridge. And it, it was so clumsy and so. so, so uh, I was the one that put the suit on and went into the room. Well, we did we did things like that uh, very much with uh, Bob and, uh, and working with him and the, that stuff. But uh, as soon as I graduated, of course, uh, I went into a, I went out of that job, and I, I don't know whether even this continued, you know, but my my job there was just to keep me, so they could ship me off to Oak Ridge yes. because I really wasn't needed for there. I, but they didn't need a, a, a graduate student to do that. You went to UC Davis. Uh, yeah, I went to UC Davis. And we had a group there under um, Herb, uh, which was Herb, yeah, Young. He, he was the head of the chemistry department at UC Davis. and. UC Davis had more or less shut down. Uh, they had the army there training uh, class work stuff <clears throat> for the army. So uh, 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 we had uh, uh, we had the whole building to ourselves, it included the the. The, the, the clubhouse for the staff, <laughs> great pool table. Any, yeah. Anyway, uh, uh, we had several people there uh, uh, working on various phases of the uranium problem. They're chemists. And uh, um, Ed and I became good, good friends. Ed Wagner. Ed Wagner. Let's fast forward to your returning to Berkeley, getting hired, interviewed and hired, your trip to Oak Ridge with John Morfitt, yeah. and then... Well, I was hired once, and after that, uh, I was in. Uh, the only thing is, uh, well, I was a student, I was part-time, and I, I was more or less kept. Uh, the, the, anyway, uh, when I came back, when I came back from Davis, the Davis thing went on. I came back, and uh, after I sat around for a couple of days, they finally told me what I was doing there. They were sending me uh, to uh, to Tennessee, uh, where they're setting up process the machines for this uranium work and uh, they wanted uh, me to, to, to fly or take the train back uh, I told them no I was going to take my car and they said well you know cars are cheaper on the uh, there than they are here and I said no, no I'll take my car so they finally said uh, Okay, you can drive, but you have to take uh, um, John Morfitt. John Morfitt with you, right? <laughs> Gordon, you arrived at Oak Ridge on April the seventeenth, nineteen forty-three. Isn't that great? <laughs> and your badge number was one twenty-nine. Oh, yeah. And John Morfitt's was one twenty-two. So your first job. At Oak Ridge yeah. was what? 
Well, that's interesting because they put me, me to work assembling uh, the equipment that uh, that uh, my friend Ed Wagner had developed at Davis. He was uh, back there improving, improving it, and so on. But I was in the bottom of the chemistry building, not a soul in that building except the construction people. At Oak Ridge. At Oak Ridge, 92, 10, I know, something like that. And, uh, and what, what was I doing? I was assembling these tubes that uh, Ed had, had developed. It's a, it's a Pyrex tube about I think about three feet long, with seals on the ends that had uh, uh, permit them to rotate without leaking uh, in or out. And and so they had all these they had all these tubes uh, uh, that, that I started to assemble. Uh, and I never got to the point of. Of uh, putting them into a into a fixture or anything, just doing the tubes, and I, they sent me a, a girl, a, a lady to help me uh, prepare the, the, the these uh, bearings and and so on. Uh, so, but I that that was uh, just getting ready for. Uh, processing uranium and I, I thought to myself this is silly yes this stuff just barely put, put put stuff out it wasn't and Ed kept working on it all the time we were in Oak Ridge out in the back right uh, place on this process and why is he doing that well the reason why he was doing that good me I the reason why he was doing it is because they were going to use this to convert the uranium from the alpha process the first time through the calutrons to this is going to be precious output from that they have to convert it to the uranium chloride tetrachloride and this was the perfect thing because it didn't have high production there was not high production needed, and it was all neat and contained. There wasn't big sloppy uh, bowls of, stuff, of chemical or anything. There were just little bits of stuff that would be the oxide, and you feed the uranium oxide in. And the uranium oxide was a, a six valence phase. The tetrachloride would not only chloride the the uh, the uranium, um, uh, but get rid of the gases. The gas coming off was a is a really dangerous uh, material. Uh, one of the workmen uh, got caught in some of that and, and killed him right there in that same building. Uh, but. Uh, there I was uh, trying to remember things. Well, I didn't have to remember. I knew exactly what to do with it. But that's what I was doing until the the R and D building opened, which was September of 1943. Yeah, yeah. The uranium that they were sending to uh, um, Los Alamos was the oxide and uh, it was converted to the fluoride there so th there wasn't any there was no place in there that would uh, tell them that there was not uh, rare earths dragged along with the process because they the, the rare earths would have the same chemistry as the uranium and uh, 
just was they, except the thing that they were primary they, they were worried about with the rarest is that they these elements have a very high neutron capture so they would be like quenchers to the bomb and uh, you and rare earths are found with uranium in the in nature, uh, the same kinds of deposits. So they they need some assurance that the 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 stuff that they're uh, shipping had no rare earths in it, and so they they gave me the job of analyzing in a, in a some more or less clean way a small amount of the product that they were shipping to Los Alamos. So uh, I worked out an analytical process where I could not only uh, detect it, but determine how much was in there. It's just a chemical um, process, you know, a clean, something clean, so you wouldn't get it, go take a quart or something back after you got a few milligrams. I don't remember how much they gave me, but it was a very small amount. And this, when you say product, is uranium-235? Uh, yes. The, the product was the oxide of uranium. Initially, uh, they would convert it to the fluoride, and uh, then they, they would reduce the fluoride with a molten metallic calcium, and that would create the uranium uh, metal, and they could separate that from the the, the, the product uh, uh, calcium oxide, but later on the fluoride process was taken over by Y12, and they shipped out the fluoride. Now that uh, they needed to know that there was no uh, no earth. Uh, not, yeah, they, they need to know that, uh, rare earths? You know, they're rare, there was no rare earths in there. Okay. Uh, the, I'm getting that con confused with another, I ran another analysis too. But that, 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 um, that, that, that chemistry, Involved um, the, the the natural uranium that wasn't, uh, and what I did was I took some uranium, I added rare earth to it, I I set up in the, my laboratory the the same purification process that they were using in production, and I, I ran the material through. Uh, it was a, an interesting pr process because uh, it, it was all uh, um, liquid purification. So they would they would take the oxides, which what's that they would end up with uh, from from uh, the chemical treatment of the pro of the cleaning of the collectors, the sump. Um, and um, they would convert that uh, to the oxide, and then the oxide would be converted to the fluoride. But uh, rare earths would go through that process. They were they were afraid they would go through that process. So I duplicated their their purification process, and I put in uh, some rare earths with normal uranium and run it through there and then that they could put in a spectroscope a spectra the spectra 
they could spectroscopically analyze it and see if the errors were there. And so I, I, I cleaned up the uranium using their process, put that in there, and it demonstrated, although I had loaded the, the uranium at the beginning there, none of it came to the process. The capture power of, of an element was measured in barns, as in barn door. And uh, that, 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 that measurement hadn't really, that was a new measurement, kind of measurement. So, so the, the physicists are kind of, were thinking like physicists and they were thinking barn doors. So the, that, the measure of the capture power was barns. <laughs> anyway, uh, the other thing I did uh, was uh, they needed to determine that there wasn't any nitrogen in the product. Nitrogen had a high neutron capture. And, um, and so I devised a, a program where I took a few, uh, considerably less than a gram of uranium, and I could detect nitrogen in it in the uh, in a by a chemical process. It was a titration problem where I reduced the nitrogen to uh, uh, um, and, uh, the alkaline form ammonia, and then I titrate the, the nitrogen in that. This, treating it as a, as a base. Uh, it, it, uh, the only thing I added to, I think, of what a, might be a, considered a routine analysis was that I did it with a very small amount of material. And on the, on the day that uh, they brought it to my lab, uh, it came by guard packing gun and staying at the door like this all the time that I was doing the analysis and nobody could come in and nobody could get out. And then I, I, I cleaned up all the stuff and uh, he took it back for purification in their process. So by cleaning it up you removed the nitrogen? Yeah, see I had chemicals in with it that needed to come out. It's a, it's a simple thing because they just they, the the purification process of of the uranium for the, uh, to to deliver to to uh, Los Alamos was an interesting process where uranium nitrate was soluble in ether, and so they would. They would uh, make a solution uh, nearly saturated with copper nitrate, so all the uranium is in the in the nitrate form, and then they, they would extract it with the ether uh, in s several loads until none came out, of course, and then all I had to do was evaporate the ether away, and they had the uh, the uh, the nitrate, which they could just then heat and it would convert to, to the oxide, the the uh, uh, uranium trioxide. Was these were these two experiments analysis done in the R and D facility of yeah. Y twelve at Oak Ridge? Oh yes, uh, I had a I had a uh, an office. Uh, I was the first one there, so I had an office next to Herb's, and right across the hall from that, I had a, my own laboratory. Uh, so anything I was asked to do, it required a laboratory, I did there. Gordon, would you please discuss some of the colleagues that you worked with at Oak Ridge 
at UC Davis or Berkeley? Uh, I'd be glad to. I first when I got here is Abe DeHaan, and I think that's significant because Abe is responsible for getting me uh, into the program. Uh, he was, um, uh, uh, I think he, he probably graduated the same time as I did, which was uh, that June in... Uh, 1942. 42, yeah. Uh, he'd been a friend for a long time, and uh, I, 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 I seem to have known him uh, more than I can remember at, at the university, maybe in lab or something. But once we got to, to uh, go with, once, once we got to Oak Ridge, uh, I didn't see him hardly ever. I just just never crossed paths, and I found that kind of, I, I find that kind of interesting, uh, that I, I just, it's like I was swept off in another direction. But, uh, uh, okay, the next name you got here is Bob Schmidt. I think Bob was a physicist. He, he wasn't much of a chemist, but he sure knew a lot about vacuum systems. And as I've told you, he designed these uh, s uh, s silly little uh, vacuum uh, distillation or sublimation uh, uh, devices uh, uh, that I first worked on. Uh, it was, uh, he had some kind of special uh, concept there, it was silly. But uh, I saw him a lot, as a matter of fact. Uh, he, he, uh, he suggested, you know, that, that I be sent here or there to do some jobs. Uh, Was this while you were at Oak Ridge? This is uh, seeing him at Oak Ridge. Uh, he, like the other guys, didn't show up until a long time after uh, John and I got there. <laughs> Anyway, uh, Bob remained a, a, a good friend throughout, and he, he seemed to have uh, uh, access to the decision makers on there in the chemistry. And uh, I remember uh, he, he designed the vacuum systems that they used in production. The uranium was made uh, by the Eastman Kodak boys by heating the oxide in a pressure tank with carbon tetrachloride and you get the, you get the uranium chloride all right but it is sloppy and in order to clean it up so that it would evaporate right in a vacuum and get all the gassy stuff out of it. They distilled it, they sublimed it the way we did at Berkeley in the physics lab, but in much larger uh, Quantity. quantities, more along the lines of the one that Bob and I were fooling with. Uh, there. I told you about the dry room. Yes. Uh, anyway, uh, he, uh, he had, he, he was kind of, uh, I think, uh, was a um, uh, go-to guy at, for one of the big offices. And, and I remember uh, jumping ahead of myself toward the end of the war, I mean, uh, yeah, toward the end of the war, uh, they were generating enough uh, U-235 uh, makeup, that is then not the product, but the, but the uh, after the first process, uh, they had a certain enrichment, and it was precious, but it was bulky also. 
uh, he designed and uh, he went to uh, the big shots and he said, look, we're going to have to uh, do something uh, about purifying the, the enriched material. And so they, he argued that they needed a building, so they started designing a building. Uh, and I worked on that. That was one of my ex. But uh, uh, he was a, a, a mover shaker kind of guy. But I don't think he was really attached. He probably was attached to um, the main guys, you know, the big shot. Like I was attached to the guy who was in later attached to uh, in a in a. In a go-to guy uh, with the on the chemistry group. Uh, so he is a great guy. Uh, he had a BS just like me. As a matter of fact, all of us, uh, uh, except for the jazzy ones that came from Eastman, down from Eastman Kodak when they brought all their guys down. Um, uh, he's a smart guy. And John Morfitt was uh, my buddy and uh, lived with me in a house with uh, about four other guys, Eastman, no, three were Eastman, three were Berkeley, a uh, house where we did our own housekeeping and cooking and so on. Uh, uh, now. <laughs> tell you about John. All the way, he, he had this, let's hold this a minute, he, he had this whole, this crazy thing about all the way across the nation on my dashboard. <laughs> that, that kind of stuff. That was John. Yeah, I learned it from him. <laughs> And uh, he was also uh, one of the guys in our chess group. We had a we we had a um, some of us got together, and about once a week we would get together and play Kriegspiel chess. How many on that list played chess with you? Well, there's there's just John and. Uh, Dr. Jenkins. Dr. Jenkins was my physics teacher at Berkeley and a, and a really good friend. Uh, Did you buy bourbon for him once? No, I bought rum. Rum? Uh, we, couldn't, we, we couldn't buy liquor anywhere in Tennessee. It was dry, of course. So uh, occasionally uh, we'd drive down into Georgia and just over the border we'd buy our, our booze and come home. Well, when I went down there, they, I, I think I liked gin or something. They didn't have any gin. So I brought back rum. <laughs> and it's rum I had no taste for. But, but Herb... Herb Jenkins did like it, and, and, and he, I think he's eventually the only one that drank of that, that bottle of rum. <laughs> he was a really good guy. Well, uh, when we were playing uh, chess, uh, we didn't talk a lot about business, but sometimes it would come up, a problem would come up that somebody didn't understand or something we get into discussion and that that was uh, I know we had quite a discussion on spies you know and uh, we knew that there were an awful lot of them around and just ask everybody the, the boss not the boss but the leader the technical leader at Davis uh, I think was just such a person and uh, he's the one that got the guy fired for talking in, in the hallway. Anyway, um, uh, 
the, Jenkins was really good. And I never knew where he was working there. He must have, he must have been going back and forth to the University of Berkeley, uh, there at Berkeley, because he was sometimes he was there and sometimes he wasn't. And in the latter part of the war, he wasn't. But when he was there, he was uh, he, he he was t telling them about a problem that had shown up in the in the calutrons. Uh, they know how much material they caught to the collects in the in the in the collector box. I think they call it the sump or something. You know, physicists talking and. Uh, uh, and and I I understood why they I had I had been asked to set up an analytical uh, laboratory in the basement of the production of the Calutron building uh, ninety two oh two or something like that one um, and they were ripping out everything in there and. I, I, I knew they were they were looking for the uh, the the enriched uranium because they knew how much they should have due to the current reaching the box, but it just wasn't there. And uh, my my laboratory was helping them uh, do this research. Uh, Anyway, uh, uh, I, I, I knew that there was this thing, and then it stopped. And, well, that's it. But they kept the laboratory there. I wasn't there then. But they kept the laboratory there. At the chess game, <laughs> he said, he told, he, he told this story. Okay. That's okay. Just... He told a story about uh, they they uh, had uh, just uh, invented a new a sump that, uh, that to improve the process, and they improved the process was not uh, not to let this stuff get away because. When this, when the, when the iron beam comes over there, it's coming in at a hundred, few hundred volts, you know, and it, it, when it, a thousand volts, huh? but w when it loses its charge hitting the inside this sump, it's so energetic that some of it pops out over the hole that it came in, and it's more than likely to do that, considering that. Uh, uh, that uh, it has so much energy that it can unmelt itself. <laughs> yes. Sir. Anyway, so they uh, that that was uh, uh, that was the beginning of the story. The story was that they had changed the sump and they call it the sump with a bump dump <laughs> and that told me more than just that the efficiency went up it 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 told me what i was doing what they were doing when they were looking for the uranium and it's, things like that would come out. They wouldn't give the thing away, but I could put things away with what I knew, and I had a great picture of what was going on. Uh, anyway, that, okay. that's how he wanted to be my, that was my hero. That's Dr. Jenkins. He is my physics teacher. I say that over and over again. That's okay. You liked him a lot. I did. Now, Ed Wagner worked with me at Davis, and 
he was he was kind of my buddy there. He had a car there, so we got around. We go play. We go play uh, badminton with the girls at, at night. Uh, you know, after work. Uh, one Christmas, um, we he, he had something going, uh, and he had a friend with the house, and the friend was away. So at Christmas. We had a turkey. I I went in the morning and I started the turkey baking. He and and, and he he tended to his project, checking in on it, working it, and then uh, at at uh, later in the morning, uh, uh, he, he came to he came to work. Oh no, I I, I went and took care of his stuff. And he stayed with the turkey, and then afterwards we had it. We ate the whole damn turkey, and within three bottles of champagne. <laughs> and anyway, we never needed to get around, I borrowed his car, for dates and things, you know. Now, nice lady friend there. Uh, but he invented the, this thing that would trickle uranium through there. And that you spoke that about earlier. That was the earlier. thing with a, with, a, with a little clicker knocker on the, yes. on the glass to, to, to keep it moving. Uh, he continued to work on that and it puzzled me until just, just recently I began to put some more things together while I'm thinking. And they were using that process to to, to uh, chlorinate the oxide from the first the calutrons to make the chloride to go into the beta calutrons, and um, uh, I, I, I just wonder why I was so slow to catch up on that because he kept working on that. The whole time I was there. Talk about uh, Herb Young, and oh, Herb Young was, of course, uh, my boss uh, at uh, R and D, and I, I think he 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 pulled me back from other jobs that I had because they needed somebody in the head of the chemistry department. Uh, he was overall of the purification and also I think uh, the assay department where they determined the purity of the 235 um, uh, and and so I I get shuffled around uh, I, uh, I I got jobs like they needed somebody to check drawings for beta production buildings because they were doing it laboratory wise and they were uh, looking to, to move it into a higher production mode and that called for a new building those vacuum chambers that I mentioned Bob Smith's uh, stuff and uh, also the chemical uh, pur uh, purification uh, was all uh, Pyrex tubing and uh, really uh, a big chemistry building. You had an incident where the metal arches in your shoes. <laughs> well, one of the jobs that I had, the uh, Herb would send me out on these jobs. Is uh, took me to uh, had it was necessary for me to climb up on top of one of these calutrons. Well, calutrons had magnets that were, uh, I'd say, I'm just thinking thinking off of the, uh, uh, 10 feet high, no, 8 feet high, and uh, uh, I, would, I would say about uh, maybe 6 feet deep. That's a lot of magnet. Well, they had a, you couldn't use 
metallic tools around that. Uh, so uh, everything in there was bronze. Uh, everything uh, that uh, pliers, wrenches, everything, all tools were bronze. And so they, because it's, it's a powerful magnetic field, 5,000 Gauss, which is a lot, maybe it's five, something. Anyway, uh, that's, uh, the way he, uh, Herb gave me a job, I think, which meant I had to go up on top of one of these magnets and check something. Well, I got a ladder. I took out all of my, everything out of my, my trousers. Uh, I didn't wear glasses then, so I didn't have to leave those behind. Uh, and I, and I got up on top of this thing, and uh, when I stepped down in the magnet area, my foot was whoop, to one side. <laughs> That's okay. And explain why your your foot moved to one side. And the reason was that I had an arch support with a steel face, a brace in it, a steel format. <laughs> I'm glad it didn't recognize a steel when it sees it. <laughs> Me. <laughs> I had a big 